Okay. So what I've done is I've just taken like chunks of notes from five, six, and seven that I'm emphasizing on the exam. And so I've just pulled those PowerPoints forward so that you can ask questions about them. Okay. So we'll go through, but uh, really this is this today and especially Wednesday, you really have to bring your questions Wednesday or we're just going to be bored looking at each other and uh, then we'll just quit, you know, and, but so it, this is a chance to really pick my brain over what I'm going to put on the test and, and ask questions about things that you're not getting. Um, <clears throat> I teach this course about every, every two to three years. And so my notes change quite a bit. And in fact, uh, uh, that's why I'm kind of late sometimes on getting the notes out to you because I'm totally redoing all of my notes this year. And so when scheduling the semester, you know, it's, it's a little janky. I, it's off a day. I probably should have this test on Wednesday, uh, but I'm not going to do that to you guys. Uh, but we're kind of ahead. So that's why this week is pretty empty. But that allows you a really good chunk of time to study for the test. It just is it's my fault for, you know, not not having it perfectly lined out in terms of the schedule. I thought this material would take a little more time. So we're a bit ahead. And that's okay. It's going to work to your advantage if you will take advantage of the time that you have to study. I want you guys to improve your grades if you can. And uh, so this is your week to do that. And these this Monday and Wednesday lecture time is really for you to, to make sure you understand every little possible nuance of all these problems so that when you come into the test, it's like nail it. Okay. I really want to see a bump in the grades on this exam. Okay. <clears throat> So I've got, I mean, I'll just, what I'll do is I'll go through each of the slides and just kind of like hit the topics and then we'll go back to the ones you have questions about. So I, I put in there the stuff from chapter five on heat of reaction. The main thing is being able to use this table and then figure out products minus reactants and calculating delta H of reaction. And then we have the, the, the bond, the bond ones using, uh, Oh, well, this is just an example of the heat of reaction using the tables. So this is the kind of table you had in Alex, but we can have a different kind of table like the one shown on, on this slide here. You know, if you get this table on the exam and you find your products and reactants in here, then you should be able to do the deltas. And we'll do, we can do one of those example of problems in a second. Let me just walk through everything I have on the review. Okay, so here's an example problem. Then we had the group additivity ones with the with the bonds where we make and break the bonds. So if you're given a table of, of bond energies, can you construct the delta H for the reaction? Okay. So so here's an example problem of that. We have methane and oxygen reacting to form CO2 and water. And we have the bond energy tables. And so we just have to break the bonds and that we add all those energies to break the bonds because we're going uphill. And then we subtract the energies of the bonds we make because we're going downhill. And so there we have our delta H of reaction using the bond energy tables. Yes. Yeah, you'll have to have those. You'll, so I'll, I'll have a, a, like a, a table, like one of the pages, you have a periodic table. You'll have a page of bond energy values and a table of uh, enthalpy of formation values. And so that you can go and you just tear that off your exam. And so when you're doing that problem, you can look at the numbers and, and do it that way. Okay, then I get into um, another example of that. And then we get into light. This was chapter six. We start talking about spectroscopy and how we learn what's going on with the atom. This is how we discovered the behavior of the electrons because we really don't have a, a probe small enough to measure the electrons. We have to use something and light is our probe. So the way that electrons interact with light, uh, we have now discovered a bunch of theories that tell us about that, like quantum mechanics, the energy levels based upon the wavelengths and, and the wave functions of those electrons surrounding the, the uh, nucleus. So we have different kinds of spectroscopy. We have absorption spectroscopy, where we have an absorbing sample and we look at a reference sample and then the sample uh, where we can look at the missing light and wherever there's missing light that's absorption and so we have the peaks wherever there's missing light that's an absorption spectrum we have the emission spectrum so wherever the light is emitted we plot that as a peak and so this is an emission spectrum you see where 
where there's no light, it's zero, and where there is some light, you get a peak. Then we talked about fireworks and the emission spectrum of all the different atoms, and they're all different. So it's like a fingerprint for the, for the element, this emission spectrum. Then we did the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is something that you need to know. So you do need to know this order up here. So the highest energy is gamma rays, then X-rays, then UV light, then you have the visible range, then the infrared, it's just past the red, just like ultraviolet is past the violet. So those are ultraviolet and infrared, and then you have microwave and radio. And so these are all the different items in your regular everyday life, uh, like, like nuclear transformations take place in the gamma ray region, core electrons and the X-ray and so on. So we can come back and review this if you have questions. Then we have the energy equations that go with this. So we have the, you know, delta E, these are all, spectroscopy is always a difference in energy levels. And so if you have the energy levels, you have the delta E and you can convert that to frequency or you can convert that frequency to wavelength using Planck's constant and the speed of light. So this, again, is some problems that were in Alex on ranking these different uh, energy spectra and, and wavelengths and so on. Then we have frequency calculations and wavelength calculations. Again, we can come back to these. Then we have the reading and energy level diagram. So we have quantized energy levels and they're discrete jumps in between. That's what the word quantum means is discrete. So we have discrete jumps between those energy levels and the length of those arrows is related to the wavelength of light that's absorbed or emitted in a spectrum. So there's some questions about this. Okay, we, we, we have the photon energy calculations and then how many peaks we would see in a spectrum if we're given an energy level diagram. And so you can go through all of those different ones and every length of arrow is gonna be a different wavelength for the peak that shows up in the spectrum. So. And so then we get to atomic structure. So that was chapter six. Then we're in chapter seven, where we start taking the information we got from spectroscopy. So like you guys in your minds probably think, wow, that spectroscopy stuff is just kind of like a standalone thing. How is it related to chemistry? It is how we learned this how we learned about core electrons, how we learned about valence electrons, how we learned about the orbitals. So it was the tool that we used to learn about S, P, D, F orbitals, okay? So the most important electrons from a chemist standpoint is the valence electrons, it's the outer ones, because those are the ones that touch as, as an atom is drawing closer to another atom, those are the frontier electrons, the furthest out. And they're, they're in the, periodic table right across the top, those different groups that are the A groups, or on this periodic table, they're the Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, five through eight. Those are the valence electrons. We're not getting into the valence electrons for the D orbitals yet. That's when you get to inorganic chemistry, if you take a whole course related to that. They have an 18 electron rule, but for us, we're just gonna stick with the eight electron rule, because it goes all the way across group one, two, all the way through group eight, which is the noble gases. And then you have the shells. So coming down the periodic table, the periods, one, two, three, all the way down, those are the principal quantum numbers, and that tells you how far those valence electrons are from the core, from the, you know, from the nucleus. And then we get into combining the shells and the shapes of the orbitals in the different quantum numbers. So definitely know your quantum numbers, your principal quantum number, your angular momentum quantum number, which tells you the S, P, D, F of the orbital. Um, the magnetic quantum number, it just shows you how many orbitals you have in each subshell. So if it's a P subshell, you have three. If it's a D subshell, you have five. And you learn that from the magnetic quantum number. And then, the, uh, <laughs> then the electron spin quantum number is just the spin up, spin down, plus or minus a half. Then we apply these quantum numbers and we get the shapes of them. So we have the shapes of the different orbitals and then the energies of those orbitals. So this is the, the energies as you fill in the multi-electron multi atoms, 
the electrons try to get as close to the nucleus as possible. So this is the lowest energy orbital is the 1s. It's the closest to the nucleus. Again, opposites attract. So you have a negative electron getting as close to the positive nucleus as possible. The 1s electron shell is uh, right there next to the nucleus. Then the 2s is further out. The 3s is further out and so on. So you can see those energies go up as you go up in quantum number. So the 2 is the principal quantum number. That's the shell you're in. So the second shell has four orbitals. The, the third shell has five, six, seven, eight, nine orbitals here. The, the four shell goes out to F, okay? And so you have the different shells, yes? Uh, are we gonna have to like, memorize that little chart? This one? Yeah. yeah, I think you should memorize this one. It helps you fill the, the orbitals in order of energy. Okay, it's a handier tool than trying to draw this, this big picture. Okay. The only trick with this is to show that, um, so, you, you know, you can, you can draw, you know, the, the S's, 1S, 2S, 3S, all the way down. And then to start the 2P right across from the 2S. Okay, don't start the 2P up here with the 1S. Okay, so uh, you just draw it like this. So then you start the 3D right across from the 3P and the 4F right across from the 4D. So it, it's pretty obvious. This is the 2S. You might do it horizontally. 1S and then 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 3D, right? But they fill diagonally. So they fill like this. It's the 1S first, then the 2S. Then you come into the 2P and then the 3S. And these are all pretty obvious, right? The 3P is after the 3S, but this is the one where it it, it shows you the difference. So you after the 4S, then you fill the 3D and then the 4P. So this is the first place you have where there's kind of an exception to the filling order, right? So after the um, after the 3P. We do not go to the 3D, we go to the 4S, and then we go to the 3D. And we see that on the periodic table, where's the 4S electrons? You tell me. Yeah, good. I've heard several people say potassium. So here's the 4 right here. So if I were to talk about the electron configuration, this last electron on potassium is in the 4S orbital. And the calcium... We got one more proton, one more electron. So it would be the 4s2 would be the electron configuration. It would be the argon core 4s2. But then we get to scandium and it's 3d because of this little thing right here. So after we fill the 4s, it's 3d. So that tells you scandium's 3d. So scandium would need to be argon core 4s2 3d1. Yes. So in Alex, it had us do like argon core. 3D1, 4S. Really? It counted the 4 it, it, it made you do that? Like it was wrong yeah, if, if you, you did looked, it the other yeah, way? Yeah, if you looked at how, how like, if it wanted, um, what's KR, chromium? Yeah, chromium. If, if you, if it wanted. So it did 3D9, 4S1. It would go KR, uh, like if it wanted TC, it would go KR, uh, 4D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 5, 2S. For this one? Yeah. That's weird. Why it would make you do the numerical. So they made you do threes before fours. Yes. Which got confusing because two problems prior to that, yeah. they made you go 4S, 3D, the, the way it really? runs. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, if, if you, so do you want us, how do you want us to do it? Um, it'll be multiple choice on my test. So that won't be two options. You know what I'm saying? Because okay. to me, those are the same thing. Gotcha. Really, the order doesn't matter, but I always do it in this order. Right. So this is the way you'll see your, your problems written. What I will do to sort of, because you got to make what's called distractors, right? The wrong answers. So you make a multiple choice test. You did a problem. You do the right answer. And then you got to come up with three or four wrong answers. So how are you going to make it wrong? So what I do typically is I'll, if I'm doing chromium, okay, which is one of the exceptions, Right, it's, it's it's 3D5 4S1 or 4S1 3D5. Either way would be fine. I'm not going to make two answers that because to me they're both right. This makes sense. Okay, but what I will do is I'll I'll make chromium a a, a 4S2 3D4, which is not correct because that's one of the exceptions. I'll I'll make instead of argon core I'll put neon core 
or I'll put Krypton core, right? I've got to make some things obviously wrong. Or sometimes I'll do like 4S2, 4D4. And that's not the 4D, that's the 3D. So you see, I, those are the kinds of errors that I put into the wrong answer. But you got to know it well enough to know the right answer and not be distracted by the wrong answers. So pay really good attention. Is it the correct core? Is it the correct quantum number? Is it chromium is 3D, not 4D? So you've got to know all of those things. You got to know really well. And it so the exception is 3D5, right? Yeah, that's the exception. Be 3D5, 4S1. Yeah, because it steals one of those S. It's S2 electrons, but it takes one out of the S and puts it in the D, so that the S is half filled and the D is half filled. Because the that, that's that's that resonant pattern in the subshell that relaxes the whole atom energetically. So it gets to lower energy. So these electron configurations that we're coming up with are the lowest energy electron configurations. Okay. <clears throat> Good questions. And those are easy problems to ask. And, and if you know your stuff, they're easy problems to answer. So you guys can get a good grade on that. Okay. So we, we can practice. We've practiced some of these. We've got plenty of things to practice. So here's, this is kind of a nice pictorial thing of the, the stuff we're talking about. You know, we see all of the 2S, the S block. Here's the P block. Here's the D block. And you can see that those are the, that last shell or subshell that you're filling up throughout the whole periodic table. And we've been kind of emphasizing this, that it's 4S, and then it starts the 3D right here, according to this tool right here. 4S, 3D is next, then 4P, then 5S. We come in here, 5S, and then it's the 4D. You see over here, 5S, then it's the 4D, then it's the 5P here, and then the 6S. And then you get to the 4F, which, you know, we might have one of those on there too. Um, so you get down here, you get the, the 6S, and then you go to the 4F, and then the 5D. And so here's just showing you this exceptions. It's really uh, the top two. So we'll, we're going to scratch out tungsten. Scratch out tungsten. It's, and SG is Seaborgium, after Glenn Seaborg. I'm so glad he got on the periodic table. So, anyway. And then here, these, these top three are exceptions. So, <clears throat> and how do I know they're exceptions? Because look, they're 4S1, 3D5, 5S1, 4D5. Okay, and over here is 4S1, 3D10, and 5S1, 3D10. See, they've stolen one of those S electrons so they can fill up the D orbital. But everything else is, is like you would do according to that handy tool. Nickel, 4S2, 3D8. Okay. So this is 8. So you would think the next one would be 9, but it's not. It's 10. Well, how did that happen? Well, because it took one of those S electrons and made a 4S1. Okay. What about the TC2PD or RH? Oh, Quit looking at those others. Those <laughs> yeah, that's. The, I'm not teaching this exception, but that's clearly an exception. Good old palladium has stolen uh, both of those S electrons. So this is actually showing the the real ground state electron configurations. But uh, so I'm gonna mark through that one. Don't look at that one. And don't don't. Yeah, this don't one's okay. No, these. Yeah, look at all these five S ones. Those are an exception too. Right? Yeah, stop. Stop looking at those. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's great that they put the real things on the table, but they're not following the trend, you know. So the, the trends, I mean, the, the, the things that I guess the rule is, is definitely a hard, a hard application to that, that uh, row four. Uh, but you see, as the, as the atoms get bigger and bigger, they start, they start, nature's doing its own thing. <clears throat> That's why I said this rule applies to 95% of the periodic table, not quite 100. Okay, so we, then we get into the properties of the elements. This was getting into chapter seven, okay, where we're looking at ionization potentials and how hard it is to pull the electrons off of the atoms. And so we start ranking things in terms of ionization potential using this little guide here. So you got the periodic table on, the, on your exam 
increasing ionization energy. Helium is the hardest element to ionize. Francium is the easiest. And so if you're going, going to the right, it's harder to ionize. If you're going up, it's harder to ionize. So we could, we could do some practice <laughs> problems on that one. Uh, then the sizes of the atoms. So again, increasing size down here, this is the largest atom. The helium is the smallest. And so it's, uh, if you're going to the left, the atom's getting bigger. If you're going down, the atom's bigger. So then you can rank them according to size. And then ions, let's make a point on ions too. And electrons are negative. So if you put more electrons onto an atom, it's gonna puff up because the electrons hate each other, okay? They need, they need more space, okay? You start taking electrons off of an atom, then you still got the same number of protons and so they get closer and closer to the nucleus. So you're taking away repulsive elements and so they gather in closer. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So again, you can then rank them according to, to ions too. Okay, and then we had that last topic, the kind of random topic on basic and acidic anhydrides. And the bottom line was metals uh, form basic oxygen solutions. And so, and then the non-metals form acidic oxygen solutions. And so if you run this in reverse, if you take a, a metal oxide and mix it with water, you form a base. If you take a, a non-metal oxide and mix it with water, you form an acid. We actually did this. This was one of my first experiments. This is probably why I'm a chemist. This is great. I've never told this story in class. So we, we had uh, Mrs. Blackman, my, gosh, what grade was that in? high school chemistry i guess i was a sophomore and we're in the lab and we're going to make we're going to make acids by burning nonmetals in oxygen so we had let's see what we might have used mercury oxide to produce the oxygen i don't remember what we used to produce the oxygen but we had a little beaker or a test tube with a with a stopper in it and a hose and we had a bottle full of water. We put it underneath a tray, like upside down on a tray, and we ran that hose under the water, under the mouth of the bottle. And we heated up, I think it was mercury oxide, so that the mercury oxide would decompose and produce <coughs> oxygen. And then the mercury would stay in the test tube. You never do this today because mercury is toxic, but we did it. Anyway, the, the oxygen would bubble, and it would bubble up in that jar and replace, displace the water. And so we would collect pure oxygen. So then we stuck a stopper in it. We had a, a, a jar of pure oxygen with water in it, like moisture in it. And then we took sulfur um, and we lit it somehow and uh, stuck it in that bottle. And of course, it burned really bright because it's in pure oxygen. So we made sulfur oxide in this bottle. But it was also wet in there. And so it combined with the water and we made sulfuric acid inside this little jar and then we would take a little um, stirring rod and stick it in there and touch it on the ph paper and show that it was acidic so it was a super cool lab we we're doing this as sophomores in high school and then we had phosphorus we we're going to make phosphoric acid so she had a little jar of red phosphorus it was like the match head stuff so it was a whole jar of match head yeah and so it it said in the jar it said do not retrieve with a metal spatula or something like where is it yeah ceramic maybe it's ceramic and so she got a ceramic spatula and scooped some out and put it on a watch glass and my buddy was walking back over to the table with the watch glass and then she said be very careful and he dropped it like maybe two inches and it hit the lab bench and burst into flame just from being dropped and so it's burning right there in the lab and this is why i'm a chemist because my teacher mrs blackman was just calm collected she just walked over there picked it up, put it in the sink, turn on the water and put it out. And I was like, we just had a fire in lab and you're just like, yeah, another day at work, no big deal, you know? And I was like, I wanna be like that. You know, I wanna have those kind of nerves that are like, yeah, this is chemistry. That's not unexpected. Nobody panic, just go do your thing. We had goggles on, we all backed up, you know, it's not gonna destroy anything. It's producing a lot of smoke, but, um, she put it in the sink and turned on the water and it went out. And then we, you know, did, did the experiment and we put phos uh, the phosphorus, I forget, pentoxide or whatever the oxide was in the oxygen when it burned and it made phosphoric acid. We test the pH. It was really cool. So that was Miss Blackman. 
and I really thought that was cool that she was so calm. So anyway, that's my story of why I'm a chemist. Okay. I got another like addendum to that too, but probably shouldn't. Okay, so then we uh, Alex has questions associated with that. But that's the last topic in this whole section. So we've what what do you need help on? What do you want to shore up your learning on uh, of all these topics that I talked about? Electron configurations. We can practice on those. Okay, so let's do a few of those. <clears throat> Here's a little practice page. Okay, well these are the exceptions. Let's do the rules first. Let's do let's do these right here. Okay, and we got some nice uh, some cations and anions and things like that. Okay, I've done these. I've, these are already on the video, so let's do some different ones. Well, let's take chlorine. Let's pick a different atom. So, what what other atom do you want to do? Pick on pick one on the periodic table for me. What's that? Zinc. Okay, very good. Thank you. Zinc. So we go to find zinc. It's on the fourth row, way over there by gallium. And so what we do is we go backwards to the previous noble gas. So going backwards, we see that's the argon core. That's your first step. And that's going to be, if you look at your answers on the exam, anything that's not argon core, you can mark that out because that's the argon core. You're starting there, right? You might see an answer that has neon. That's not right. I'm trying to trick you. Yes. So whenever you're doing it, you just go, you always go back to the previous noble gas? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And the previous noble gas, if you're looking at uh, argon core, so that's, you know, if we did argon, let's just do that. Up. This is why we do the argon core, because argon is equal to 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So look at how much we save by just saying argon core, right? So argon is 3p6. So oh, we're we're finishing up right here at 3p6. So this right here is the argon core. Does that make sense? And then we're coming into the periodic table after argon on row four. So that tells me I'm starting right here in the handy tool. So I'm at 4s2, and then I count zinc. It's nice. The zinc is the 10th element, so I know I have a 3d10. How do I know it's 3d? Well, I'm using my handy tool. I finish off with the 4s, and then I come back into this little tool at the 3d. So 3d is next. And I'm on the 10th column of the 3Ds, so it's 3D10. Yeah, so these ought to be really easy. Like you could get this down and you could just three points, three points, three points. You could just be nailing this part of the test. But you gotta learn it, right? So if you don't learn it, it's impossible, but if you do learn it, it's easy. So that's the nice thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, now, since we've done zinc, let's do copper because it's right next to it. And copper is one of those exceptions. So, so copper is argon core as well. <clears throat> but because copper is one away, it's in the ninth column, you might think it's 3D9, but that's close enough to 3D10 that it'll steal an electron from the 4S. So this would be 4S1, 3D10 exception, right? <clears throat> and the reason it's an exception is because it that 4S is not full. The, the, the 3D orbitals took one of the 4S electrons, and so that's why it's an exception. Normally it would all be 4S2, 3D something, but it's 4S1 this time and 3D10. Let's, let's do uh, nickel to show what I'm talking about. So nickel is argon core, and it is not an exception. So it's 4s2, and it's the eighth column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We get to nickel, 3d8. So this this exception is referring to the 3d10. 
and the 4S1. You see that? Okay. It breaks the trend. Let's do zinc, zinc plus. Zinc cation, just the plus one cation, not the common one, which is two plus. So let's think about this. If I'm, if I'm at zinc here and I take away an electron, it's isoelectronic with what? Copper. Copper, which means isoelectronic means it has the same electron configuration as copper. So if I take an electron away from zinc, it has the same electron configuration as copper, and copper is one of those exceptions. Okay, so it would be the same as copper up here. So zinc plus, let me just do this. Um, let me let me use the correct term: isoelectronic with copper. So therefore, it has the same. It's isoelectronic, same electron configuration as copper. <clears throat> oxygen two minus. Let's go to the periodic table. Here's oxygen two minus. It's isoelectronic with what? Yeah, good job. Neon. Someone said it right away. Neon. So we could just really save time and just write on here, neon core, and we're done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's why oxygen likes to be two minus, because it has that electron cloud, just like neon, and it's uh, very stable. What about sulfur? Sulfur two minus would be argon. Yeah. Chloride one minus? Argon. Fluoride one minus neon. Yeah. So that's that's explaining the the nonmetals why their common ions are two minus and one minus. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we're good. Yeah. Yeah. So those are electron configurations. Okay, what other part of the material that I kind of talked about today would, would you like some help on? Can we go back over um, like the delta D equals? Uh, Just those different calculations? Yeah. Okay, so, so this was this was back in. Stuff. Yeah, um, it was in the spectroscopy part. Yeah. Here's one with numbers. Is this kind of what you were talking yeah. about? Yeah, okay. So this is a good one. So we've got this A to C transition. Um, it's very hard to see in terms of this chart here, but if you were to take these numbers in this chart and look up the values for A and C in terms of their energies, this is what you would get. This top one was 1350 and the bottom was 500 and it was a zip to joules, 850. Yes. Um, so once you do that, you have to multiply it by 3.0 times 10 to the 8 power. But is it, like Alex, it, like every time I did that number, yeah. it would tell me I was wrong. So I had to use a different number. Which like it was, Alex gives you two nine. It was like two, two nine, 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 nine. They wanted but it like four. The four they, they wanted the like actual, not the rounded up version. Oh so really? Nine. Yeah, three times ten to the eight is ter definitely good enough for my test because your problems will be far enough. Your answers will be far enough apart, so you can use three times ten to the eight meters per second for C. Yeah, the Planck's constant is H, and that um, yeah. So here's what I've got. 
these are the numbers I use for my for my making my tests. I use three, and I use uh, six. I I'm, because I have it in my head so much. I use six point six two six. So it's a little inconsistent on my end. I have four significant figures for Planck's constant. I have three for for speed of light. Um, most of my answers are given at two significant figures, so that you and I round differently. We ought to at least be correct on the first two digits. So if you conclude three and and I include three and four, and I, I round it to the first two digits, and you round yours to the first two digits, we ought to match exactly. But if you're off by like the you know, if I say two point one is the answer, and you get two point two, or maybe even two point three, if you look at the other answers and they're farther away then it's the 2.1, circle that one, you know. Sometimes that number will have a none on it, right? And and occasionally a student will say, well, I got 2.3 and you had 2.1, but the next one was like 5.3 and 6.8 and, and 80 <laughs> and none, but you were definitely closest to the 2.1. So select that one, don't select none. Okay. Are you going to be giving us Planck's constant? Uh, it's, on the, it's on the table. Planck's constant. Let me let me just verify that. But I, I'm ninety nine percent sure. So let me let me pull up the the. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. Here we are. And so yeah, these are the. Yeah. So right up here we have Planck's constant here. We have Boltzmann's constant, which we haven't even talked about. So there's more stuff on here than you need. But for sure, Planck's constant's there. Speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, you need to be comfortable with it's meters per second, but this is meters, seconds to the minus 1. Those are the same thing, right? Seconds to the minus 1 is the same as per second. Okay. Here's uh, There's even 1 pound is 454 grams, if you ever needed that. One inch is 254, 2.54 centimeters. So there's that too. Um, so anyway, those are there's lots of information that I just keep on every periodic table so that people don't mess up those things. Yeah. So this one, I, again, I, this was one of those uh, ones where I, I took a little shortcut when I did this problem, and that was um, because I, this is Zepto, and so that's 10 to the minus 21. And so instead of doing like a full conversion here, yeah, I just inserted this piece right here. So that took the place of the Z. Which is exactly what you would have. I mean, you would have uh, um, 10 to the minus 21 joules for every zeptojoule. And so you see the Z, J cancels, and you end up with 10 to the minus 21 joules. So you can do that all in one step if you just realize that those little letters, those prefixes, you can just take them out and put in the, the, um, the power of 10. So like if I have 200 nanometers, that's equal to 200 times 10 to the what? Nano. So let's work our way down. So we've got uh, the meter. Then we have a centi. What is that? 10 to the minus 2. Then milli is one more. 10 to the minus 3. Then micro, we'll go by threes now. Micro, 10 to the minus six, then nano, 10 to the minus nine. So 10 to the minus nine meters. So you can just take that, that lowercase n and put in the power of 10. Kind of rhymes. Okay. Cool. And so then, again, this is uh, that calculation. So I took this equation right here. And I wanted wavelength, and so I, you know, I divided both sides by delta e and multiply both sides by lambda, and you see that those swap places, and so then I was able to solve for the wavelength. Okay, and then I wanted it in nanometers. So, yes. Uh, 
So on your test, are you going to like to ask the question, are you going to show the table or are you just going to put it in words? Probably in words. It would be like a in the energy level diagram, you've got a spacing of <laughs> 850 zeptajoules, or, or I might give it to you in uh, some other energy unit, okay? So let's do one at, where the spacing is in kilojoules per mole, okay? In fact, let's, let's combine some things, okay? This is going to be good. Okay, so let's go way back here to the bond energy table. Here we are, okay. <clears throat> What wavelength of light will break? Pick a bond. What bond do we want to break? HC. Say again? HC. HC. Okay. So like we got methane, what wavelength of light is going to break this bond? Its bond energy is 413 kilojoules per mole. An HC bond. Cool? Okay, so that's, you know, from the bond to its breaking is two energy different levels. And this is the difference is 413 kilojoules per mole. So we've got to get this all the way over to, to a, a delta E in joules. So um, delta E is equal to 413 kilojoules per mole. How do I get that out of the per mole? I don't like the per mole part. Uh, yes, and so how do we write this? We got to use our units. So we write this in the bottom, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd per mole. So Avogadro's number is per mole. So the number is on the opposite side of the mole. So we would write this upside down so that the moles cancel. Okay, and then I also want to get out of kilojoules. So I have a thousand joules per kilojoule. <clears throat> Is everybody okay with that? Notice how I'm always including my units. I'm not doing that just for teaching's sake. I'm doing that for my own sake so I know I don't screw up the problem. If you follow the units, you'll know you did the math right. And I see that's the probably the number one way students who who kind of know what they're doing screw things up because like they got the math they got all the numbers they need but they're in the wrong order because they didn't use the units and they multiply by avogadro's number instead of dividing by it. and 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 if they'd use the units they wouldn't have messed that up so somebody punched that out on the calculator Jules. Okay. Yeah. Let me just check real quick. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah. Six point. Yeah, I got the same. Okay, good. All right. So that's our energy, our delta E in joules, and wavelength is equal to H C over delta E. All right, so we've got Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Okay, units, pay attention. Planck's constant is not a per, it's a joule times seconds. That's another place people mess up. It's joules times seconds. So there's no divide there. And, and that makes it compatible with the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second you see now those seconds cancel and then we're divided by joules 6.8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules so my joules are canceled <laughs> okay my per second has canceled with seconds and i've left with a distance which is a wavelength fantastic All right, so I get 2.9 times 10 to the minus 7. 
meters. And then I look at DW's test and I see my answers are all in nanometers. And I go, dang it, I've got meters. So I've got to check, convert this to nanometers. So what do I do? I multiply this by 10 to the nine nanometers per, per meter. So 2.9 times 10 to the minus seven meters times 10 to the nine nanometers per meter. I get 290 and that's letter C. And I know I did it right. Okay. Question for you. Is this, what spectral region is this wavelength in? You've got gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and microwave and radio wave. And so the nanometers you should remember, what's the blue light nanometer? So this one you should know, blue light is 400 nanometers, red light is 700. So the visible region, this region is 400 to 700 nanometers. So this is blue. This is red. So what this is to this we just calculated is 290 nanometers. That's shorter wavelength than blue. It's in the ultraviolet. OK, which means that methane this CH bond stuff should be transparent, meaning visible light should go right through it. But if I get into the UV, the UV starts breaking those CH bonds. So this is a way we could tell if a substance is going to be colored or not. If one of these bonds here in this table is in the visible region, which we can calculate this way, then it's going to be colored. It's going to absorb a blue or a yellow or a red wavelength of light. But if it's ultraviolet, then you won't see any color change in this substance. But if you get into the UV light, it starts breaking CH bonds. That's why our skin, we get sunburned. The UV light starts breaking bonds in our skin, in the dead skin cells and then in the live skin cells. Okay, so that's why UV light's damaging. It starts breaking bonds. Can yes. you also do it as uh, 10 to the negative 9 meters? Uh, yeah, you could have put this one nanometer. Yeah, you could definitely okay. do that. that was I did a little bit. Yeah, I did a little okay. differently. Gotcha. Okay, so go look through the material. Bring your questions on Wednesday. And then you all make A's on Friday. Is that good? Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that.